Good morning. Welcome to Sturgeon Bay Moravian Church. It's good to be together in worship this morning. And uh, welcome to all of you who may be joining us online as well. A couple of announcements this morning. Uh, Shiloh services will start this Thursday. So uh, Vesper service at Shiloh at 7 p.m. on Thursday evening. And also, we are still looking for Quincy Street ushers. Uh, it's a, a service that we have provided uh, at that elevator entrance ever since I've been here, so it's been more than 20 years anyway. And uh, it's an important one, and we need some new folks. So if you feel like it's something you could do, uh, call the office or contact the office and volunteer. Please continue to keep uh, Dave Plummer in your prayers as he is continuing with his ongoing cancer treatment. And also, uh, you'll notice in your bulletin there's a little handout that gives some of the history of John Huss, a brief history. Um, this, is, this is the weekend that we normally celebrate communion in his honor of his martyrdom. Uh, this would be the 609th year uh, and he, of course, is the spiritual father of the Moravian Church. And this, uh, this Sunday, there will be cookies on the patio, I am told. <laughs> That's a little in-joke for those of you who were here last week. We didn't get them out there quite on time. Uh, but Jean is here, so she will take care of that for us this Sunday. <laughs> So let us take a few moments to prepare ourselves for worship. We're here to be in the presence of the one God, the God of creation, the God of spirit, and the God of salvation. Ours is a loving God who calls us into worship, into fellowship, and into service in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us stand together and sing out the good news with hymn number 630 in the Moravian Book of Worship.
Please remain standing and turn to page 139 for the Liturgy for National Occasions. Praise the Lord, all you nations. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live upon it. Let all people everywhere know that the supreme God has power over the human kingdom and that he can give it to anyone he chooses, even to the least important. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Praise not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Please be seated. Almighty God, ruler of nations, to whose grace we owe the manifold blessings of this land, we confess that in many ways we have turned aside from your commandments, and it is because of your steadfast love that we are not consumed. You offer us mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against you and have not obeyed your command to walk in your laws, which you have set before us. Have mercy on us, blot out our transgressions. We pray, Lord, that you will guide and bless all who are in places of authority, protect them from violence, and fill the hearts of the people with respect and love for them, because you have established their authority. Raise up for us leaders who will carry out all your purpose, and in patience and courage, will depend on you. Save your people and bless your heritage. Make of this nation an instrument for the promotion of peace, freedom, and righteousness. May it be a haven for the oppressed of other lands, 
a home of happiness for all who dwell within its borders. And may our commitment to liberty and justice for all be preserved for the generations to come. Hear us, gracious Lord, in heaven. Guide us and our leaders through the spirit of Christ's love as we struggle with matters of teaching and learning, home and family, health and security, work and justice. Turn the hearts of all people to you that they may seek eternal life through Jesus Christ, who redeems us and our world. Grant wisdom to those who are of the family of faith. Enable us to accept the authority of government for your sake, ready for every good work, abstaining from every form of evil, and paying to all whatever is due them. As citizens of this nation, may we bring credit to our Savior in all we do. Grant to the people of this and all other lands a love of peace and order that the nations shall learn war no more. Hasten the day when the kingdom of the world shall become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Please stand. be here to come join me, please. dogs and um, ice cream uh, and our dad made the hot dogs over our fire pit. Oh, that's as good as it gets. So I bet you didn't eat 58 of them, did you? That was what the guy had, they always do on the 4th of July. They have a hot dog eating contest and the guy ate 58 hot dogs. That's pretty good. Did you go to any parades or huh? did you go to any parades? Or, no, okay. Um, so Usually, the fun thing that happens for us on the 4th of July is the fireworks down at Sunset Park, and we live right above the park. 
And the great news is we don't have to go down to the park to see the fireworks. We could just sit at the end of our driveway. And, um, but there's one problem because there's this really big tree that kind of blocks out our view. Um, but I got to tell you, the greatest thing happened this week. Um, the power lines run right through the middle of that tree, and the utility guys came and cleaned out the middle of that tree. And so we had a great way to view the fireworks. So it was a happy 4th of July. So I'm going to ask you a question. Who do you think were the very first people to celebrate the 4th of July? Any ideas? The people after the Revolutionary War. Yeah, that's true. Well, interesting, fun Moravian fact. The very first celebration of the 4th of July was held by the Moravians. That's right. We had the very first 4th of July celebration in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Now, what is kind of interesting about this is that at the time, we lived in these communities and we were pacifists, and so they tried to be neutral through the whole war. They had hospitals that cared for people on either side, but I thought it was pretty interesting that the first people, the very first celebration recorded in history was with early Moravians. So we continue that tradition of celebrating the, the privilege um, and joy that we have of being a part of this wonderful country and, and uh, celebrating the hope and promise for what we can be. And uh, so I'm glad you had hot dogs over the fire. That sounded really good. And ice cream? What kind? We had drumsticks. Drumsticks. That was a good fourth. All right. Well, thank you for coming up. I appreciate you guys, and we'll see you soon. First at everything. <laughs> Let's take a moment to bow in prayer. God of wisdom and faith and God of patience, you are our God, and we know your power is beyond our comprehension. You offer to us power and wisdom and love. You can and do make all things new and good, yet we often do not believe it will be so. We do not think miracles are for us. We're afraid to ask for fear that you will fail us. We ask that you help us, Lord, in our unbelief. Teach us to have patience, patience that issues forth from faith even in the midst of our darkest times. Forgive us when in our impatience we turn away from you and seek help elsewhere. Bad things happen in our world and we feel helpless and it tries our faith. So we ask that you work a miracle in our hearts, O oh Lord. Help us to be a positive force when bad things happen rather than just standing by and wringing our hands after each calamity. We do live in fear that bad things will strike close to home in our own families and in our own congregation. We ask that you protect our loved ones, bring miracles of peace to their lives. Be with all those who are sick and suffering this day and heal them. Of course, Lord, there are many joys in our lives. There's hot dogs and drumsticks. And we acknowledge that fact with humble thanksgiving. We are grateful for this great nation that we live in where we can join together and pray together as we please. We take some time then this morning to some time of silence to come to you with our concerns, most especially our joys and our thanks. God of miracles, hear our prayers. Raise them in the name of one who came back from the dead and lives forever, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You can remain seated for hymn number 635.
Good morning. Our scripture lesson today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether it was in body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so, so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. So today is Terry's birthday. Now, I was seriously planning on having us sing while you were standing up here. But then this passage was about being afflicted by a messenger of Satan and a thorn in the flesh, and I did not want to do that. So, but we're still going to sing to you. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, and you even got harmony. That was good. This lesson today opens with, I knew this guy. That's what the Apostle Paul says in this opening passage. I know a man. I knew this guy. Whenever I hear that phrase, it sparks fond memories in me of my dear late friend Jim Sarkis, who taught me the value of always having a guy or a gal in your life that you could reference to whenever you were tackling any problem or issue that came up. No matter what I ever brought to Jim over the years, I would go to him for his assistance or his guidance, and he would get this twinkle in his eye, and he would always say, don't worry, I got a guy, or I know a guy. So Paul's guy that he references here, though, is someone who has had the most profound of all spiritual experiences. Uh, someone who in, had an encounter with God, and it tells us it took him up to the third level of heaven. That description was appropriate for the Jewish readers of this epistle. You see, the Jews thought there were different levels in heaven. Remember the old department stores, and you had the different floors? In fact, when I take the kids to New York, we, I make them ride the elevators at Macy's because they're made out of wood. But I always tell them, you know, the good stuff is really up at the top. So anyhow, this guy went there to the very best part of heaven. This guy being referenced is Paul himself. You see, Paul doesn't want to seem as if he's boasting about this profound experience that he had, which probably is referencing his conversion on the road to Damascus and the incredible intimacy that he experienced with God But he wants to refer to this as something to happen to another person, and that's why he can then boast about it. I've been to the top of the mountain. I've seen it. I've had it all. Have you ever felt like that? Ever had that moment in life where 
things are really just so very good. Had a moment in your life where it seems like everything's come together. You feel like everything's going your way. You're racking up the W's, feeling like the world is at your command. Well, that's how Paul felt from this experience. And he uses the sense of power and fullness, though, to teach one of the most significant lessons we find in all of Scripture. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weakness. He then goes on to tell us that he has no reason to be conceited because Paul had an issue. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it away from me. Paul confesses here that there was something in his life that tormented him. It was so bad, he begged that God would take it from him. Now, scholars, oh, they make great discourse about what was the thorn. They can write pages and pages with their varying opinions about it, what, what it may have been. Was, a, was it a mental health issue? Was it some type of physical ailment? Was it some kind of specific sinful behavior that he could not get a handle on? You know, the bottom line is we don't know. We don't know what this thorn was in his flesh. And that's not really the point. The point is not that issue. It is the issue. The point is, what was Paul learning from this experience as he dealt with it? This passage allows so many of us to identify with him. Here's the great apostle confessing that there was something that caused him great torment, something that made him feel powerless and helpless. Anyone who has ever dealt with depression or anxiety, you know about the thorn. Anyone who has battled an addiction, you know about the thorn. If you've had a chronic illness or you're battling a disease, you know about the thorn. If you know grief and sadness, you know about the thorn. The list is endless and it's deeply personal. But I dare say that there are very few that ever walk this earth that at one point or another, they don't find themselves desperately praying to God to relieve them from a burden they feel that they cannot bear. I know I have. I have found often that in such suffering, people very easily become angry with God. God, if you're really there, if you truly love me, then why would you let me suffer like this? Certainly when we are suffering, we want relief. We want the pain to stop. This is a part of living in this broken and sinful world that has so much adversity that can come our way. The question is, how do we respond when that occurs? You see, Paul doesn't get angry. He goes a different direction. He, he came to understand that that affliction was teaching him humility. More importantly, it taught him about the extent of God's grace. An undeniable truth. It is in our weakness that we truly find the blessings of God's grace in our lives. It is our need. It is in our struggles. It is in our most challenging moments when we have no power to save ourselves, that we truly realize God's grace, what God's grace is really about. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. There are some thorns that eventually get plucked out, and there are some that we live with. Do we have the faith to hope that God's grace is sufficient for us. We come to the Lord's table today. We do so, as Reader mentioned, remembering the founder of the Unitas Fratrum, the Moravian Church, John Huss. He laid down his life for his deep and abiding faith in the sufficiency of God's grace and that it was God's grace alone that saved him, not the church. 
unwilling to compromise on this, he walked to a martyr's death. So as we come to this table today, I invite you to bring your thorns. God does not love you for your strength and your success. God just loves you. Thorns and all. Amen. I invite you to turn to the Moravian Book of Worship to page 196 as we celebrate Holy Communion. In the Moravian Church, we practice an open communion. That means all who are here that wish to participate are welcome to have this experience of grace with us. A word about how we serve communion. The elders and pastors will be bringing the bread and the cup to you. We'd ask that you stand with everyone in your pew to receive them. We'd ask that you hold on once you've been served until all have been served, because then we partake together. This is a reminder to us that our faith is not ours alone, but it's lived in a community of faith. If you're a child and uh, you wish to take communion, we'd ask that you go through our communion training program here at the church. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Please stand. Let us pray. God of grace and love, we come to this table and we pray as you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the same night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please be seated.
Please stand. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. By your divine presence, by the holy sacraments, by all the merits of your life, sufferings, death, and resurrection. In the same manner, after supper, our Lord took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink of this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Please be seated. stand. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, drink from this, all of you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.